Hey, yeah. Randy here, and we've got another great chat lined up for you today on the product experience. I mean, I say we. There's a whole team who work together to bring you these episodes every week, but it feels really weird to say we whenever I do an intro without Billy. But we split our responsibilities recently where each of us recorded some great chats with speakers from the Mind the Product stage at the Pendemonium Conference, while the other emceed the actual stage. So today it's me firing up the infinite improbability drive to talk to someone with a brain the size of a planet for a conversation that's truly fascinating. I got the chance to sit down with Miku Jha. She's the director for AI and ML and generative AI at Google Cloud. And we talked about how they actually make this stuff work at enterprise scale. It's, it's fascinating stuff. Hey, we're live here at Pandemonium in Raleigh. I'm here with Miku. She was on stage earlier and gave a really interesting talk about AI and how to make it actually work. But Miku, for anyone who wasn't here, didn't get a chance to hear your bio and your introduction, can you just do a quick introduction? What do you do these days and how did you get into this world in the first place? Sure, no, thanks. Thanks, Randy, for having me. And I'm having too much fun at uh, Pendo, so really happy about being here. Currently, uh, I am running Google Cloud's Partner Engineering Group, and it's very much focused on AI in the sense that we are working closely with our partners to really kind of, you know, take the generative AI-based solutions and applications from interesting concepts to actual real deployments at scale so that it can start delivering the business value and business outcome. Very excited about, you know, the chance that I have in my role also. And in terms of how I got into AI, that's a very different story. I, mm -hmm. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded multiple startups. And then one fine day in 2014, <laughs> I got up saying I want to do something and reduce food waste. At that point, a lot of articles and mind space was that we need to grow more food to feed people. Uh, and my take was that what if we wasted less food, mm. you can get to the same outcome. So that's where my journey started. And, you know, I started doing rounds with farms in Cape Valley back in Bay Area. And after seven or eight months, decided to uh, build a solution which can help supply chain reduce food waste by automating the food grading process. Oh, wow. So you know how when you buy something, you see the USDA grade one, two? So that's a very manual, tedious, subjective process when it comes to supply chain. And that's the solution I ended up building, which was using AI, predictive AI, because back in 2014, there was not much about generative AI, mm -hmm. and built that solution to, to help businesses you know, become more objective in how they grade food and in the process reduce waste. So it was, I would say, the reason I succeeded, which holds even today and maybe holds more today, is that I started from a business problem. Mm -hmm. I wanted to reduce food waste and AI just ended up being the best tool to accomplish that outcome. And today, in a lot of my interactions as I assess the ecosystem, I see that we are starting from AI for the sake of AI. Yes. And I think we need to change that and then we will start seeing better outcomes. It's interesting in the, in the UK where I lived, there's a company that took a similar problem and attacked it in a very different way, which is they started marketing wonky looking fruit and vegetables yeah, yeah. as attractive and useful mm -hmm. and saying, don't waste it. So no technology, just marketing and labeling and positioning. Yeah. And it's a really interesting way of doing it. You don't always need to throw yeah. the magic pixie dust of AI just for the sake of fixing a problem. Exactly. And, you know, that's something we, today, like we understand generative AI, we understand there is something very real here. There are a lot of applications. But now we are seeing that it's not the paradigm of one size fits all, right? Like there's no such idea of one single model which will solve every problem for an enterprise. Right? So again, you have to figure out what is the use case, what is the business problem, and then make a practical decision on which model would be the right model to solve that, which is where I think you know, a lot of what we are doing at Google too. For example, Google, we have our own model garden as mm -hmm. part of our Vertex AI platform. And that model garden today has more than 150 foundation models and mm -hmm. other models based, built from Google itself, 
build from open source partners, build from third party partners, so that you can choose the right model for the right use case. Okay, before we even get to choosing yeah. an AI model or choosing AI yeah. as the thing at all, yeah. I'm curious, we, we were talking before we turned the cameras on about there is a little bit of a hype cycle around this, yeah. and more recently we saw this with things like crypto and blockchain. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can tell, the best business case for those technologies was often separating VCs from money rather than solving a yeah. real problem. Yeah. Um, and I still see the same mistake being made with AI. AI, actually, I've seen real practical use cases for. I think that there is good stuff there as opposed to some, sometimes yeah. with the other things. But most of the companies, most of the people I know are still taking a very reactive approach. It's the sales or mm -hmm. leadership coming and saying, can we use AI in this rather than, and being reactive to a perceived problem mm -hmm. rather than saying, is this the best tool? So yeah. you had four key success factors that you were talking about to making enterprise AI work. Can you, let's start there if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. I think it's really uh, important to figure out what is the recipe for success, right? Like what does the playbook look like? Especially when in many ways, it's a very overwhelming time from technology perspective, mm -hmm. where every day there's just so many new things which are announced, new capabilities which are announced, which is great from the pace of innovation, but from the business leaders and decision makers, they need to figure out, kind of cut through that and say, okay, what should be my strategy here yeah. to get to my outcomes? So, and the reason we, we, I talked about these success factors because it comes from our experience of working with enterprise customers for last 18 months, right? That what is needed, right? So first thing is that, like I was touching on it even before, businesses today have multiple scenarios in which Gen AI specifically can help them, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, you know your marketing department or your HR or your IT or your developer productivity. There is a role that Gen AI can play in any of these. But it also means that you might you will be dealing with multiple models, right? So then the notion or the decision on a platform becomes really crucial because you're not gonna be maintaining the entire life cycle of, of a model in-house for each single model. You need a platform strategy, right. right? So that's one. But then you say, okay, what what should I be thinking of when I'm thinking of investing in a platform? Because that's probably one of the most strategic decisions that you have to make. Mm. Because you're not doing this investment in Gen AI or the platform for one problem. You are future-proofing your investment for the next pace of innovation of digital transformation for your business, mm -hmm. right? So the most important thing, I think, is that when you make a decision on which platform to go with, you have to be sure that you have optionality and choice in the platform. Why? Because of two reasons. One, we don't know what we don't know because yeah. we haven't been through deploying enough Gen AI applications into production. So what happens a quarter from today is the narrative yet to be written. That's one. And second is that that optionality will future-proof your investment over coming years, right? So choice and optionality is really important when you think of which platform should I invest in for my strategy. And then uh, the next thing which is important is the knowledge and data. Like what differentiates you as a business yeah. from everybody else? They're all gonna have access to platforms, capabilities, and models. That democratization is happening, right? So that's not where the differentiation comes from. It will come from your business. What's the unique value for your business? What is the unique data that you have? What's the unique knowledge that you have? Can you bring all that together and then go for that application, which would be your IP. So that differentiation is number two. And number three is enterprise readiness. If you think about it today, not a lot of applications which are in early exploration get deployed in production. And the problem is that we are dealing with very different world of what happens if there is a leak in my data? Mm. What happens if you know there is a hallucination in the model? How will it impact my brand, right? Am I ready to make those decisions from a business perspective? So that enterprise readiness is the next factor, which is crucial. And you just talked about hallucination, and this comes up a lot. Yeah. This is one of the most dangerous things because 
in almost everything we've done in the past, at least everything automated, there's an audit trail. Yes. We, uh, we can map how processes yeah. work and they can be complicated, they can even be complex, mm -hmm. but we'll have a record of how something, a decision was made and be able to uh, iterate yeah. and change for the future. It's not so easy with AI. What, what, how do we handle that? What's yeah, the, yeah. How do you uh, protect yourself? No, it's, it's a tough one. You know, on a, on a lighter note, I, I say that, you know, hallucination is like more of a feature <laughs> as opposed to a bug when it comes to... When I, okay, <laughs> so you're going to have to explain that one. <laughs> what I mean is that it's the inherent, it's the outcome of the inherent way in which the language models or foundation models learn, mm -hmm. right? So you can't, like, at the core of it, you can't just decouple it. That's how the model learns. That's how we have gotten to how powerful the models are in terms of reasoning and advanced capabilities. But mm -hmm. we do have to figure out ways to have guardrails around it, Yeah. right? And one of the ways is by grounding it on data, right? So, for example, uh, I'll give you an example of one of the journaling organizations we worked with. Mm -hmm. So now journalism has to be probably one of the hardest vectors when it comes to I cannot tolerate hallucinations, right? Well, to some, some of what we call journalism, <laughs> unfortunately, but, but if you want to be reputable, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So the idea there would be that, you know, you, you ground that uh, responses into the clean curated data from your own journalism repository, say over last 24 months. That way when the model is giving you the output, it's cross-checking against that repository and that serves as a way to reduce hallucinations. So grounding is a very important aspect. In fact, with Google's foundation model, you can ground your data on Google search. So not only you get a more fresher source of information, because otherwise, you know, you must have come across, hey, I can't answer this question because I was trained, my cutoff was 2021. I've got right? it, but I've also gotten the other one. <laughs> yeah. is the, the lack of the ability to say, I can't answer this question at all because <laughs> I, I don't want to, to anthropomorphize, but the incentive model within the, the yeah. LLM is often to provide an answer because the KPIs are around that. Right, right. Rather than saying, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I can't give you a good answer to that yeah, one. Which, yeah. I mean, I've got a 12-year-old at home and the way we do it with him, it's, he's not an artificial intelligence, but he does a lot of the hallucination. We, we tell him to stop, <laughs> we tell him to stop child explaining to us. Yeah. And it's effectively, it's, it's, gonna sound, it's the wrong choice of words, but effectively it's shame that we're trying, and humility that we're trying to teach him mm -hmm. so that he knows w that it's okay to say, I don't know, yeah. rather than making things up. Unfortunately, he's gotten the reinforcement sometimes that if he says it confidently that, that he can get away with it. And I think a lot of the generative AI just says things confidently in the hope they'll get with it, but there's no way of shame or humility that I can see to, to answer to. What do we do? Yeah, no, so, so that's what I'm saying. Like, we are now coming up with many different ways in which we can address... So rigor. Uh, yeah, in which we can address this. One is the grounding... So you can ground it on your own data. Mm -hmm. You can ground it on curated data. You can ground it on Google search. The other aspect of it is essentially building those guardrails as filters in your model, right? So that's another aspect, not just for hallucination, but even for like, is the content harmful, mm. right? That's a big thing, right? Even so, it's, and it's not just the, is the content harmful from the output perspective? It's like, if you're gonna yeah. ask, Going in, yeah. if what about if that query is not part of how your enterprise thinks about compliance or mm -hmm. guidelines, right? So you can have this gets us into something equally important, which is responsible AI. Yes. Right. So that's where you can have the safety filters, the taggings, the categorizations, additional knowledge that hey, this content is harmful. Here is how you categorize it. Here is the response you take if that comes makes it into the input or the output, right? So I think we as a ecosystem, especially from Google's perspective, that's what I meant when I said enterprise readiness. Mm -hmm. A lot of these capabilities now, it's inherent part of the platform so that you can start having ways to get to the point where you can start taking it into production, addressing these concerns.
This episode is brought to you by Pendo, the only all-in-one product experience platform. Do you find yourself bouncing around multiple tools to uncover what's happening inside your product? In one simple platform, Pendo makes it easy to both answer critical questions about how users engage with your product and take action. First, Pendo is built around product analytics, enabling you to deeply understand user behavior so you can make strategic optimizations. Next, Pendo lets you deploy in-app guides that lead users through the actions that matter most. Then Pendo integrates user feedback so you can capture and analyze how people feel and what people want. And a new thing in Pendo, session replays, a very cool way to experience your users' actual experiences. There's a good reason over 10,000 companies use it today. Visit pendo.io slash podcast to create your free Pendo account today and try it yourself. Want to take your product-led know-how a step further? Check out Pendo and Mind the Product's lineup of free certification courses led by product experts and designed to help you grow and advance in your career. Learn more today at pendo.io slash podcast. Pendo. Enterprise readiness comes in in two ways, though. There's what you're talking about. There's also what I've seen in the past, uh, back when we were just trying to take huge corpuses of knowledge yeah. within organizations and throwing in Google or some other, somebody else's search into our own internal thing and everyone expecting it to work the way it does in the consumer world. But it's a garbage in, garbage out yeah. problem because there is no market within a company or no motivation inside a company yeah. to do good tagging and SEO mm -hmm. because you're not going to get the return in the way that there is in commercial world. Yeah. So how do we ensure that this corpus of knowledge and that attitude of what is responsible, what is our tolerance of risk and all that, how do we build that? How do we get everyone, when you say enterprise ready, how do we ensure that it's not seen as, again, it's magic pixie dust or we have all yeah. this let's just throw one of the, the big AIs at this and say, there, that's your corpus now. Yeah, no, that, you know, I think a lot of effort, to your point, to get this right, relies on data. Yes. And what is your strategy around data, right? Like there's, I always, you know, kind of share this, that, you know, there's no good gen AI without data, but also there's no good way to utilize the insights from that data without gen AI. Yeah, right? fair enough. So it's like a it's like a cycle, right? So I think businesses have to kind of at the end of the day answer some really basic fundamental questions to to your point about enterprise readiness. First of all, it's like are you data ready? Is data in a shape, state or form that you can feed it or that the models can consume? Second is responsible AI, right? Like what are your inherent corporate guidelines or policies in terms of what you define as responsible AI, right? Mm -hmm. As Google, we published it as one of the first companies that these are the things we are going to do and these are the things we are not going to do mm -hmm. when it comes to AI, right? So you need an equivalent of that. And most important, which I think a lot of enterprises miss today, is that responsible AI is not the last mile before you take something to your hundreds of users. It should be a day zero strategy. So that we see as a miss because it's not a check mark, it's not a feature that you'll just put as a last thing before you take it to scale. So you shouldn't be doing a proof of concept then adding this, this is an inherent part yeah, of your proof of concept. because it's part of your entire principle of how you want to take AI to scale, right? And it, it's, it's a paradigm shift because we are not used to doing it, but that's what is needed, right, from responsible AI perspective. And then equally on the other side of it is that what is your end goal in terms of how many users? What is the volume of that workload? What will it look like at scale? And then plan for that early enough mm -hmm. because those numbers of what is the cost that you're gonna deal with? What is the price? What is the performance? What is the latency, right? Have you done that back of the envelope analysis mm. early on so that it will help you do the evaluation of are you on the right track? to choose the model or the platform or the solution, right? This, this goes into an interesting place of when do you use uh, somebody else's model as, as a commodity and when do you start fine tuning and building your own? Yeah. And you have you had a few different fine tuning models. Can you talk yeah. us through that approach? Yeah, no, so this is, this is really interesting. I would say uh, a year back, I would say yes, you know, for selected use cases, which may be true even today, you can 
full fine tune a model. That means train the model from scratch. But then we have made so much progress in the last 12 to 16 months. And one of the philosophies that we have, at least from Google, is that you want to make these foundation models so powerful out of the box that when you as a business want to use it for a certain use case, you don't have to go through all of that. You have to do very minimal delta level of effort mm -hmm. to adapt that to your use case. So today where we are at, except for maybe some corner cases, you don't as a business really need to go think about full fine tuning any model, mm -hmm. right? That's number one. Then number two is that you again have to answer the question. There's a whole spectrum of choices when it comes to fine tuning, right? So you have to figure it out that what is the skill set that you have in-house? How much data do you have in-house? How much is your ability to absorb the cost and the time to market? Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to do this, which option you choose, each of these parameters I mentioned is a factor, right? So you make that decision based on that lens, and then you choose. In many scenarios, you might not even need to do any fine tuning, because today, a lot of solutions can work well out of the box, to what we discussed earlier using RAG architecture, mm -hmm. where you're essentially just making that specific data available to the model, and that's pretty much it. And model is able to you know, factor that in and generate more informed responses. Right. So you might not need to do at all fine tuning. Again, this goes back to what is the use case? Start from the most non-intrusive option. Mm -hmm. If you don't get the performance, then go for incrementally the next option, then go for incrementally the next option. As opposed to saying, I'm gonna you know, invest $10 million and build a model from scratch. You don't need that today. No. Right, so. Okay, you just mentioned RAG architecture. Yeah. And I think that's something that, it's a phrase that has become very popular and not everyone really understands it. So can we just go into that for a moment? Yeah, no, so, so RAG, first of all, it stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. So there are two aspects to it retrieval and then generation, right? But the, at the macro level, the idea is very simple. The idea is that, like I just touched on it, right? You have a foundation model, you want to give it your corpus of data, right? For any of the reasons which we touched on, it could be to reduce hallucinations, it could be so that the responses comply with your corporate guidelines, it could be because that's a unique data set that you want the model to pick from. So for any of these responses, you would Typically, we are seeing that businesses are having a lot of success with RAG architecture. So the idea is that imagine you have um, 100 PDF files for marketing campaign. Now, you want the model to factor that in when you're asking queries from it. So you'll take those files. Now, it gets into a little bit of a complicated of how we make that happen, right? So you'll have these files. You'll chunk them. You'll break them into chunks. Then you will embed them because you are only dealing in bits and bytes when it comes to the model then you will generate the vectors and then you will store it. So now that you have stored it, now when a query comes, you're going to do the other way around, right? So you will generate the embedding for that, then you will have a way to match that. You'll get the top hits, you will figure out those chunks, you'll bring it back, you'll blend it with the prompt, now you will give this revised query to the model and you'll get the response. So that's kind of a very high overview of how RAG works, but we from Google have simplified it a lot so that all these steps that I talked about, you kind of, you just need to have a single API from Google's Vertex search, which we are offering at the, um, for the RAG. And then underneath, all of this will be taken care of. So essentially we are simplifying it so that you as a business can hit the scale on RAG much faster in much more efficient way than before. Okay, we started this conversation in a different place and <laughs> we went from, we don't want to approach this as a hammer looking for nails. Yeah. So let's take this step back. What needs to change to make this more successful in terms of people understanding when to use these tools mm -hmm. and making the right choices, making intelligent choices, and get really enjoying the benefit of it, rather than just saying, we're starting with AI because buzzword. Exactly. No, and that, that you know, it's surprising, but it is, we are still there. <laughs> but I think what needs to change is that decision makers have to really answer the question that what is the business problem? What is it solving? What is the success criteria? What is it that you're measuring? If you can answer those four questions, it might sound very simple, but that serves as an anchor for all the other decisions that has to be made. 
And I also think that we have to be at a point where we have to start seeing some wins. So for example, start with your internal applications, right? Start with bringing Gen AI, infusing Gen AI rather into your developer productivity. You can measure the ROI. It's probably one of the most straightforward way in which you can measure the ROI. That's one use case. Then you bring Gen AI into your, any kind of your IT ops. You bring Gen AI into your help desk. Now, why I'm talking about these applications? Because these are internal applications, mm -hmm. but it gives you that first base of getting the operational efficiencies, measuring the operational efficiencies, and it gives you that DNA, that skill set that you need to take applications into production. So once you do that, then you are ready to get to the next phase of taking those applications for your external user base. So right now we're making the decision about where we infuse it, often based on sexiness. We like playing with toys. Yes, it's Who, changing, yeah. it's changing, but it needs but, to. But the four questions that you asked yeah. are very sensible. This is, what are we trying to achieve and how we know that we're successful? Yeah. Why, what are the criteria for us mm -hmm. choosing a tool? Who should actually be choosing when we implement AI versus something else uh, or how we, which tools we use? Who, who should be making that choice responsibly? You mean, who, what is the profile of the Who, who in the company should be yeah. making I think that it's choice? a, it's a, it's a, honestly, it's a collective decision mm -hmm. because today what we are seeing is that you have all these different line of business decision makers. Mm -hmm. Like you might be responsible for the marketing. Your decisions, your guardrails might be completely different than the person who's heading the QA, yep. right? So at the line of business level, I think there needs to be that decision making, but here's the important thing. When you are taking that to scale, then that entire change management has to come together. Yeah. Because if there is an impact on your brand, that's not mapped to a line of business, it's mapped to your entire organization. So change management is the biggest thing. So like, like we discussed, right? The responsible AI aspect, the governance aspect, the data aspect, the ethical aspects, what you are comfortable with from your brand perspective, how are you going to process the hallucinations, what guardrails you have put in place. All of this is a common set of kind of changes that typically organizations put together what we call a center of excellence, yep. right? And then you have all the different stakeholders to align on that and then you can start cranking on specific use cases. And this all comes back to responsibility <laughs> and the fact that because these tools are becoming easy and easier to implement and people get frustrated with proper governance processes, there's shadow IT and shadow IT will now start using these things and it becomes embedded. And we could talk for hours on that. <laughs> I don't think that's the topic for today. So. Yeah, no, I think see, we are making progress as a whole. We have made amazing progress in terms of the capabilities of foundation models themselves. Like today, if you go, and, and, and I encourage you to do that, go bring up the notebook LM yeah. from Google and upload any file, and you'll get the most realistic two people podcast out of that file uh, without any- Not as realistic any, as this, uh, oh, sorry. Right? <laughs> but my point is that we have made a lot of progress in probably the fastest pace of yes. innovation that I have experienced. And I've been through four waves. I've been through cloud, I've been through mobile, I've been through SaaS, so this is my fourth one but there's nothing which comes close to the pace of innovation that I'm seeing with Gen AI, right? So we are getting there. We are getting there in terms of extracting the ROIs, deploying it in production, getting to scale, right? It's fascinating because if you think about mobile, it took us seven years to get to a point where you could start seeing first flavor of mobile first applications. We are just maybe at the most two years into it. Yeah, I remember, I think we only have time for one more bit, but I remember early on in, in all of this, the dream was we had all these different silos of data and if only we could come up with common data standards, then things would actually yeah. work. Now we don't have to because we've got RPA, we've got AI to, to do lots of these things and fix the fact that we are inherently imperfect in the way we store mm -hmm. things and deal with it. And some things out there that can make educated guesses and, and make the connective yeah. tissue yeah. in the same way our brains will. So what's the one thing that you wish people would take away from, from all this? One thing that uh, you think would make the world better if people uh, knew it and started applying it tomorrow? I think it's about, you know, you have something, we have something so powerful with us today and it's completely accessible, like you said, mm. uh, to anybody. 
right? So it's the first time that, like, you know, when I was thinking of reducing food waste, it took me years to get to the point where today you could get there in months. You can have single entrepreneurs who can solve some of the biggest challenges that we have because a lot of that power and capability is served using the progress we have made in, especially in foundation models and Gen AI. So I think one takeaway is to take all this as a tool and start solving some really crucial problem statements which are out there. You don't need an army today. You don't need a massive team. You don't need, honestly, to, to get to the first set of that experience. You don't need to wait for years and years. So the whole aspect of taking a solution and letting it apply to solve a real problem has changed for the better, right? And that's what I think we should cap in on and solve some really amazing, complex challenges we are facing with Gen AI. Miku, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The product experience hosts are me, Lily Smith, host by night and chief product officer by day. And me, Randy Silver, also host by night. And I spend my days working with product and leadership teams, helping their teams to do amazing work. Lou Ron Pratt is our producer and Luke Smith is our editor. And our theme music is from product community legend Arnie Kittler's band, POW. Thanks to them for letting us use their track. 